This lesson is sponsored by Skillshare, a one-of-a-kind online learning community for creative people by creative people. With Skillshare, you can explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity. Hi everybody, Court Jones here. In this video, I'll show how I tackle a difficult subject, doing a master study of a classical painting, but as a caricature. The painting I'll be caricaturing is one of the famous portraits of Napoleon crossing the Alps by French neoclassical artist Jacques-Louis David. As an illustrator specializing in caricature, I pride myself on my fairly realistic rendering style and attention to the construction and the anatomy of my subjects. I want my work to be funny, but also to be grounded in reality. My techniques and style are a result of my traditional atelier training, which entailed a lot of drawing and painting from life, as well as doing master's studies. By the way, if you're interested in learning more about how to draw your own caricatures, check out my course, The Art of Caricature, at proco.com slash caricature. So the first step is to figure out the concept for the exaggeration, meaning the relative sizes and proportions of everything. The composition is actually already figured out for me, but when you change the proportions and sizes of things, you might need to reorder or rebalance the composition. So I'm going to figure that out at this stage. So it's going to basically be scribbling, keeping the pencil moving constantly. I'm going to figure out the big masses, mark off the tops and bottom of the figures here, try to stay within these bounds. So I had this idea about making the horse sort of like this chubby bean shaped body with tiny little spindly legs. I just think that's kind of funny looking for a horse anyway. And Napoleon's body, again, doing the bean shape, pretty good for the torso, is going to be really small relative to the size of the horse. Tiny little legs too. Then the head, of course, I want to be massive because the bigger the head, the smaller the body's going to look in proportion and I really want to play with the idea that Napoleon was very tiny. I have to remember I need to leave room for his big hat as well. I won't go too much into the exaggeration of the facial features here. It's more about figuring out relative sizes of the head to the body, Napoleon's body to the horse, and the horse's proportions, and where it sits generally within the picture frame. I'd like to exaggerate the tail. It's so big and long in the original painting, but I don't want to obscure too much of the horse anatomy, so it's a bit of a balancing act. Of course, figuring out how to get these hands and arms into position around this giant head too is a bit of a creative problem here. I might not be able to do the head as large as I want, or maybe I'll just need to think about where I'm putting it here. And he's got this amazing billowing cloak or cape or something that's essentially making him look like this superhero, which is being blocked again by his massive head and <laughs> the horse and the hat. So I guess I'm just going to have to push it out further here. And I'll figure out the exact anatomy of the drapery at a later stage. This is just, again, to get the concept, figure out how I'm going to rearrange everything. Now let's just do a little bit of a quickie face in here. Going to work on the likeness separately in a different drawing, but I just thought I'd put a little bit in here to start down that road to start thinking about how I'm going to solve his likeness. Let me just throw in a little bit of the landscape and uh, I think we'll know where we stand. I think I like where this is going. The only thing I might consider doing is enlarging the head perhaps a bit more, maybe shrinking the horse down, keeping its body proportions, but making it just a little bit smaller. And maybe that'll allow more room for the head because, you know, the head is, the likeness is fairly important in a caricature. And that's traditionally why they always did big head caricatures. Uh, so the likeness would be more easily uh, readable when it's printed small. In this case, I also want to do a big head to showcase a very tiny body to show that he's very short. So I've got my preliminary concept sketch in view just off camera. I'm going to be referring to that when I do this step, which is the rough sketch. I'm marking off the borders or the perimeter of the big shapes here, sort of like enclosing it within a gift wrapping, just because I don't want to accidentally draw it too large or run out of paper. And for the shapes, I'm getting them directly from my concept sketch, just trying to recreate those big abstract shapes. In this early phase of the rough sketch, I'm still just blocking things in with simple, clean shapes. Right now, I'm just focused on drawing the shapes as cleanly as I can, firming up my choices about the exaggeration of the proportions. I'm also considering the flow and action of the pose. I'm still laying the groundwork for what comes later. So this is still basically what we call a gesture sketch. 
And as I get further into it, I'll be able to build on top of this to work out details like the anatomy and drapery. When you build a house, you have to construct the framework and walls before you can start decorating it. I've got the gesture sketch laid in, and that's a really critical step. Uh, much like the concept sketch, it's laying everything in, it's figuring out where everything goes. I did go maybe a little bit bigger than my original uh, envelope shape that I had created, but that's okay, that's gonna happen sometimes, I think. So I've got all this down, and I'm gonna start making things more specific, making more specific decisions about the anatomy and the structure, and being a little bit more careful now that everything's laid in. Now, I've never made a study out of horse anatomy, but I have studied a little bit of human anatomy, and there are a lot of the same muscle groups, they're just in different configurations. But the same principles of light and shadow apply, hard and soft edges to show where there's a cast shadow versus a form shadow. I mean, it's really important to know anatomy, but when lacking that anatomical knowledge or that experience drawing that type of creature, you just have to fall back on what's familiar and rely on the principles you learned from studying what you are familiar with to make this kind of drawing look more convincing. So there's basically a strong single light source coming from above and from the left. And that makes the lighting and shadows really a lot more simple because it makes really clear shadow patterns, really clear hard and soft edges. And if they're not that clear in the reference material, in the painting, I can fall back on my understanding of how light and form works to make it look good in my own particular study. Since I'm caricaturing things, the muscles get pulled and stretched, the anatomy changes. I just reassemble the pieces in a slightly different configuration, but the pieces should all still be there. So I want to give the horse a little bit of a facial expression and more personality because, of course, it's caricature and the rules are different. You can have a little more fun. And he kind of looks like he has a crazed expression on his face. I'm not sure if I want to go with that or just make him more of a happy looking horse. I think the horse's face is just a little bit funky. I was trying to caricature it, but the bend in the nose here and the muzzle doesn't quite look right. I'm going to try to reshape the top of this head here. I thought it'd be more interesting to add a bit more of a wavy structure, but I don't think that's working. Could maybe make the nostrils a little more flared and bigger. Gives a more silly, sort of like a mule-like appearance rather than a horse. And uh, I guess as the story goes, he really did cross the Alps on a mule as opposed to a majestic steed. So, kind of fun to reference that, I think, a little bit. Zooming in on the uh, horse's face, he also seems to have a lot of hair flowing from the side here. Covering up the part of his face too, which is good for me because it hides some of the anatomy that I don't know. <laughs> When doing a study like this too, one of the things you want to ask yourself is how veridical to the original do you want to be? Like how true uh, and how much do you want to copy exactly versus how much you want to change? Of course, in a caricature, you're changing a lot already. I mean, you're redesigning all the shapes, but things like the curls and the hair here, how important is it to get every single tendril and every single lock of hair? I, I personally don't think it's that important as long as the general feeling of the original is present. Because of how much I'm changing the shapes, enlarging his head, changing the shape of the horse, Napoleon's extended arm here, I'm going to have to make it come out in front of the horse's head in order to see it. It just wouldn't make sense to have the arm way up here by the cheek or above the head as it is in real life because his arms are just way tinier, of course. So this is one of those things where I have to redesign the painting quite a bit in order for it to anatomically make sense. Thinking a lot about the design here, about the S-curves, and how I want to balance out the top versus the bottom. I don't want to repeat shapes. I don't want to have bloat and pinch in the exact same places. So it has to have a nice sort of snake-like or flowing water type design. Now I do want to do some rudimentary body even though it's mostly covered up by fabrics and folds and drapery because I want it to have a solid feeling and I want the limbs to feel like they're connected to the same torso. Because if I don't, there's a good risk that all the folds and the drapery and the fabrics over the body might make the body look more disjointed and disconnected if I don't do the underlying work of laying in the anatomy underneath. I'm just going to trace over my initial quick thumbnail sketch here and be a little bit more careful about how I go about it. I think that limb feels a little too long because I do want them to feel a little shorter than that. So I'm going to bring this knee and calf back a little bit. In the original, David was actually, you know, flattering him and idealizing his physique. And he may have looked like that. He, you know, he probably was in proportion. I hear he wasn't actually really that short, at least not by the standards of the day. 
But of course, that's sort of the gag and that's how we think of Napoleon today as being very, very short. So, that's what I want to come through in the caricature. You can probably tell I'm drawing this hand. I mean, this whole thing is pretty small. I ideally would like to be working on a little bit larger piece of paper, but since I'm not, I have to really simplify the anatomy into just cylinders and cubes. I'm just treating the palm of the hand like a flattened cube and the fingers as sort of tapered cylinders. In some areas, I'm moving directly into the clothing. I'm sort of hybridizing my drawing here. I'm drawing the idealized anatomy along with simplified clothing. It looks kind of confusing down by his waist and legs here with what all of the clothing is doing, but it's not that complicated. When you look closely at it, it's basically just his blue overcoat with a white sash wrapped around it that's tied on the side and then a sword. So it's just those three elements really. And I can simplify them a little bit. And I mean, I kind of have to at the stage of the drawing because I just can't get that much detail in it right now. I think I'm going to have to get pretty creative figuring out this flowing yellow cloak because I've changed so much of the proportions. There's not enough room to recreate it exactly as it is. So I'm just going to have to figure out a way to make it make sense given the size and proportions of everything. Now it's time to move on to the face. The face, though, in the painting by David on the horse is reported to not be an accurate likeness. The best likeness that I've heard that David captured was the famous one of Napoleon in his study. That's the appearance that we're most familiar with when people think of Napoleon. And he's a little older, maybe a little pudgier. That's all right, though. I mean, that's, I think, how I want to depict him because he looks a little more distinctive. So let's go ahead and just use this one here. I've already got the basic head shape laid in, but... I can maybe even erase that a little bit if I want to have just a bit more room to play around. Give him sort of a square jaw in the initial lay-in, but he has really, really soft, almost non-existent jaw line. I'll just really round that off a lot more. Of course, I am going to be using the hairstyle, the wind blowing the hair from the original painting of him on the horse, as well as the lighting, the overhead lighting with the strong shadows. I'll apply that lighting to this caricature design, even though the lighting's different. At least it's pretty much the exact same angle, so it shouldn't be too difficult. When I'm doing caricatures like this, I tend to just scribble with the pencil, just sort of loosely at first, try to just figure things out. I just like to keep the pencil moving and take quick little mental snapshots of the face, and I don't spend too much time looking at the reference image. I just try to burn it into my memory and draw more from my memory. That way the caricature will maybe turn out a little more exaggerated. That's a good tip in general, and that was one of the lessons of my caricature course, actually, was memory sketching. I think it's super important to be able to draw from your memory as much as possible, in any kind of art, really, but caricature specifically, because when you try to draw from what you remember about the person, you're more likely to editorialize and change things, and that's what caricature is all about. It's about your honest reaction to the person's likeness and not what they really look like. It's what you think they look like. For me, I see him as having this nose that stands out from his face. I mean, it could be just due to the way they idealized him in the portraits, sort of giving him a Greco-Roman nose. He maybe didn't have that in real life, but that is what we're used to seeing with him. So, this nose is like really tall. The bridge is tall. It stands far off the front plane of the face here. But let me first draw a center line here so I can align the lips properly. And I'll find the angle of the mouth. And the angle needs to make sure I match the alignment of the eyes and the nose. And I'm just drawing the ridges of the philtrum down to the top front plane of the chin. It creates this sort of little triangle shape and that helps me figure out how far in front of the center line the lips project. And with him, I, I don't think they actually project very much. I might have actually created too much of a bend here. To me, his lips, at least in this portrait, are very, very flat to the front plane of his face. They don't really stick out much at all. So, I'll just keep that triangle shape more straight with the center line right here. But the mouth gets really small and pretty high up, pretty close to the nose. I want to make sure that the mouth is equal distant from the center line, each corner of the mouth I should say. And I use those, this triangular guidelines to draw the peaks of the upper lip because they do line up with the ridges of the philtrum. I see him as needing to have a much stronger chin. That's not quite working for me here. So, now that I've got the face laid in, I see what I want to change about it. And luckily I drew it pretty light, so I think I can erase it without too much trouble. I don't have any room to draw the chin further down, so I really have to move everything else up. So I'm going to draw the mouth more like up here. Redraw that center line. 
And the nose. I still want a long nose, so everything's just going to have to be moved up quite a bit. So the central axis of the eyes will be quite a bit higher, just right up here. And the brow ridge, the brows right about here. And then that's going to have to move the hat up just a bit more. It would have benefited me to do a few thumbnail sketches of the face exaggeration, and, but I didn't do that. And as you see, it got me into trouble because I didn't have the distances planned out very well. So the main problem most people have who are new to caricature is trying to figure out how to find and exaggerate a likeness. In my full Proco course on the art of caricature, I spend a lot of time talking about that. From the fundamentals to more advanced techniques to make the likeness funnier and more exaggerated. I can't go over all of that here, but what I can tell you is the basic premise of how caricature works, which is this. Wherever your subject's face deviates from the average proportions of the human head, like what you see in classic art books by people like Andrew Loomis, those are the traits which become more obvious and more deviated off the average in your drawing. If your subject has a longer nose than average, make it even longer in your caricature. If their mouth is smaller and closer to the nose than average, make it even smaller and closer to the nose. If you make good observations and good choices about what to exaggerate, you'll end up with a funny drawing that has a strong likeness, because you made that person's distinctive traits even more distinctive. Okay, now back referring to the horse portrait, I want to make sure I get the hat and the hair right, so I'm looking at that again now. Much like with the horse's mane, here I'm trying to capture the feeling of Napoleon's flowing hair, without worrying about reproducing every strand from the original. So now comes a bit of a tricky part where I'm trying to blend the lighting from the horse portrait with the features that I decided I wanted to draw from the portrait of him in his study, which is an older version where he has a chubbier face. So I'm just kind of sort of splitting the difference here. In the horse portrait, his cheekbones are where the shadow sort of breaks away from the light from hitting the upper cheek, but here the cheeks are more full and rounded. Terminator, the shadow is going to be just a bit lower on the face. And it's really more of a dark half tone. I wouldn't really necessarily call this part of the lower face in full shadow. That's what I reserve for underneath the nose, underneath the inside corners of the eyes, and under, under the chin would be pure shadow. But the bottom planes of the cheeks and the side plane of the nose, I think, are just dark half tones, not pure shadows. Super important. So many people clearly don't know what's going on inside the ear, and it's always really obvious when they don't know. It's not that difficult. Once you commit the basic structure of the human ear to memory, it's pretty easy to regurgitate it and just invent it even if it's not clearly visible in the reference. In this case it is, it actually looks pretty good here. But also remember the placement of the ear, the height of the ear, will help show the viewer the tilt of the head because if it's the lower ear it'll show that the head's tilted up or if it's a high ear it'll show that the head is tilted down. In this case it's pretty much lined up. His head isn't overly tilted up or overly tilted down, it's pretty much looking fairly level at us. Okay, now let's go back to the portrait of Napoleon on his horse to look at the lighting again. See there's this great cast shadow on his forehead from the hat. And the cast shadow is going to have a harder edge, of course, than a form shadow. I drew a through line here from the back of his hat on the right to the back of his hat on the left, and I see that the hat on the left was a little too high. So now I'm just plotting out the highlights on the hat here. I can see there's a slightly lighter, I wouldn't even necessarily call it a highlight, but a, uh, a lighter half tone right down the center here. That's catching the majority of the light on the hat. Before I shade things in, I just like to map out the edges of where everything's going to go since I am drawing it and hopefully eventually painting it in a fairly realistic representational manner. Just a few more landscape details to figure out now and I can go ahead and start shading in everything and really start bringing it to life. I'll probably not do the figures in the background just because I want this to be a portrait of Napoleon and not necessarily going for historical accuracy with the painting and the context under which it was created. I just kind of want to create a funny portrait of the man and the image of the man. Plus, if this were an actual job from a client, like for a magazine, chances are they would want the most simple, easily readable image possible. And likewise, I don't know yet what I'm going to do about the uh, writing on the rocks. Maybe I'll find a way to put a gag in there, but for now I'm just going to leave it blank until I think of something. I think the only thing I really need to do here is plot out the shadows on the face. I kind of abandoned that actually, or I didn't quite finish, but the eyes here have this really sort of a soft cast shadow, not really hard. Nothing on this face is really hard edged on the original, so I just want to outline where the shadow edges are going to be without making it look too overly outlined. 
Okay, let's start filling in some shadows here. When doing my first pass, I uh, don't really discriminate too much between what's shadow versus reflected light. They all just get averaged out into the same value, which is pretty light. I don't want to have to erase anything later to make things look like reflected light. So I just kind of want to build up to my darks gradually. Shading evenly does take a bit of practice, but that's why I like to sharpen the pencil to such a long point. It makes shading a heck of a lot easier than doing cross hatching with the tip of a pencil. There's obviously a lot more detail going on inside the tail and the mane of the horse, but just want to lay in the shadows first and if there are any highlights I can pull them out. I just see almost that entire tail is pretty much in shadow, with the exception of maybe the part that's coming around underneath the belly, but I'm not too worried about that just yet. So now I'm starting my next pass on the shadows, going a level darker, especially in the cast shadows and the areas where there's not a lot of reflected light. I'm now starting to try to bring this up to a full range of values. And since this image is being drawn relatively small, it's just, you know, 16, 18 inches tall, I may rely a little bit heavily than I normally would on outlining to just help bring some clarity to the forms. Even though it's not really a painterly technique to outline, it's more graphic and illustrative, but just for some emphasis, I think it'll help make the forms a little bit more organized and readable if I give a crisp, a hard outline to some key features. In art, you just got to do whatever works. Whatever you think in the moment is going to be the most successful strategy. You want those strategies, though, to be built on solid foundation, good fundamental skills, understanding how light works, understanding how shadows roll from light into dark, and the reflected light bounces back into it and creates core shadows. All that stuff is extremely important and heavily comes into play when you want to be a representational artist. So as long as your fundamentals are good, you can improvise a bit and mix your styles a little bit. Just do what you need to do to get the job done. Just be practical about it and don't be a slave to any one particular ideology or a set of rules about how things work that you can never break. So getting back to his face here, I'm going to switch back to looking at the Napoleon in his study reference painting because that's the one I'm using to get the shapes of the features in the face. What I'm thinking right now is how I want to finalize the features as far as the edge work and smaller plane changes. And also keeping in mind, I'm thinking about the lighting situation from the horse portrait. So all of this is going to be in shadow, but there will be a little bit of variation in the shadow based on what I see in this portrait of him in his study. It is kind of a tricky thing to do. It's not something I'd recommend everybody try, where you're trying to combine two different pieces of reference material into one, and one has very different lighting. It's just something you have to keep in mind, the back of your mind, and you have to switch back and forth or keep both images in view while you're working just so you can easily switch from one to the other and try to hopefully come up with a picture that looks coherent, that looks like it makes sense. At this point, I'm beginning the final stage of the drawing. I'm filling in my final values. I'm putting my darkest darks in areas where the darkest shadows are in the original painting because I feel like the drawing is built on a good foundation and a solid design. I'm happy with the likeness and level of exaggeration. I also think about how I can use the pencil more like a paintbrush and add some directional shading that helps define the surface of the forms. This is mostly a smooth rendering, but I do like to find areas to leave some visible brush strokes if it can help tell the story. Before you move to the darkest shadows in your own drawings, you should take a step back and assess the success of all your choices up to this point. Because once you go super dark with your pencil, erasing it is not really feasible anymore. If you're drawing digitally, you can, of course, go back and redo anything you want at any time. But one of the reasons I recommend you put in lots of hours training and doing studies with traditional materials on real paper is that the consequences of making bad choices becomes a real factor. The idea that you could ruin your drawing at any point and have to start over helps to keep your observational and critical thinking skills sharper. When doing studies digitally, there's less at stake, and I think it'll probably take you longer to get your skills up to a high level if you constantly take advantage of the digital tricks and undo features. I love having the option to work digitally and do a good portion of my professional painting and illustrating in Photoshop, but I trained for years with charcoal on newsprint and brush on canvas, and I think that's really helped me. And one of the last big things I need to figure out are this extremely complicated horse's mane. I'm going to 
probably simplify it a bit, but just try to capture the overall feeling of the original without being too precise or worrying too much about making it perfect. So I'm just looking for the major rhythms, the biggest locks or the biggest groupings of hair, and trying to follow their path. A lot of S-curves here, but I don't worry about breaking them up into too small of forms. Those will naturally occur after I get the big groupings laid in, but I just want to tackle the biggest ones first, and then it won't seem quite so daunting the more that I have these large groups or large locks of hair indicated. One of the last things I tackle in this drawing is the shadows on the cloak. I have the source material to refer to for that, and I'm able to reproduce this part pretty accurately. If you get into a situation copying drapery folds and want to simplify them a bit or redesign them to suit your needs better, like I had to do with the drapery on the right side of his body, just make sure to capture the same general direction and motion of the original folds. But don't fall into the trap of creating repetitive shapes in the folds that are all the same size as each other. The human mind tends to like and find and create ordered repetitive patterns, and in art it's easy to accidentally insert repeating patterns into shapes when inventing or loosely copying them. Remember that variety and contrast always makes for a more interesting design. And now I'm blocking in the cloud shapes. The clouds are a great way to add some dynamic movement to the composition and also help direct the viewer's eye through the space. I'm mostly copying what's in the original, but since I changed so much of Napoleon's proportions, I have to make sure the clouds don't line up awkwardly or create a tangent with something else I've drawn. So I feel like the drawing is basically finished, but at the end I always like to take a step back and look for any places that need fixing. Whether it's softening a transition from light to dark, or making other edges harder and more defined. I keep an eye out for any hot spots or dark areas that draw my attention in a bad way and I blend them out or lighten them with an eraser. Also, I try to lift out any unintentional smudges or stray lines before calling it quits. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. And keep an eye out for a follow-up where I do a full color digital painting of this drawing. And be sure to check out my premium course, The Art of Caricature at Proco.com, where we go over the core concepts of caricature and I give you a more in-depth look at how to take your concepts and rough sketches to fully developed renderings and paintings. In the second half of the course, I share exercises that'll help you create stronger exaggerations, overcome bad habits and mental roadblocks, and we'll even get into some digital painting. Be sure to check it out at proco.com caricature. This lesson is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of ad-free classes about almost any creative skill you've ever wanted to learn. Have you wanted to dip your toes into embroidery? Then Daniel Close Painting with Thread class might be just what you need to get ahead in your thread game. Or maybe you want to brush up on your world building skills for your next project with fiction writer Lincoln Michelle's science fiction and fantasy class. I've been looking at MKBHD's YouTube success script shoot and edit class. MKBHD is a top notch tech YouTuber who releases high quality videos and reviews on all the latest gadgets on the market. I watch his stuff regularly and his videos are always well made. I'm looking at implementing tips from him that could help improve our videos. If you're interested in trying out Skillshare, I'm excited to let you know that Skillshare has a special offer just for Proco subscribers. The first 1000 subscribers to click the link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today.